I'm Forrest Scholl, the Editor-in-Chief of IEEE Software, and I'm here today with John Howey, the COO of the Cloud Security Alliance. The latest uh, special issue that IEEE Software is putting out is all about advanced software for mobile devices, and we'll be talking about a lot of very technical articles in there about how mobile devices are working at scale and dealing with all the complexities that, uh, that users are demanding nowadays from the apps and the products. But I thought it would be remiss not to have um, a voice in that conversation talking about privacy and some of the implications for the users uh, with all of these advanced features that we as software developers are coming up with. So first off, welcome, John. Thank you for joining me. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm uh, glad to be here. Pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I introduced you as the COO of the Cloud Security Alliance. Would you like to say a little bit about what the CSA is all about? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. The Cloud Security Alliance is a global nonprofit organization, and as the name implies, we focus very heavily on cloud security and all aspects of that topic. However, recognizing that today especially we're seeing a shift from consumption of cloud services away from desktops and laptops to more highly mobile devices, including tablets, phones, and hybrid devices such as phablets, as, as the industry has coined the term, uh, we've decided to focus on that area as well because it's not just about the providing of cloud service that cloud consumers have to be aware of, it's how they consume that service. And so mobile is something that we are very focused on in general. Oh, excellent, excellent. So one of the, the rules of thumb I guess I have is that the more mobile apps and the more mobile devices I use, the more security I'm giving up and the more privacy I'm giving up, even if I don't think about it. Is, you know, is that a fair rule of thumb? Is it really that simple? It's a very nuanced question with an even more nuanced answer, unfortunately. Mm. It really depends on the device and the application that you're using and how you use it. There is certainly a cause for concern amongst many professionals, both privacy professionals and classic information security professionals, about the inadvertent use of a mobile device to access information from a cloud in a business environment and having that information leak and be lost uh, to the control of the organization and stored and backed up in a very consumer-oriented separate cloud offering altogether. And here's a great example. Let's say that you've got a cloud-based email service and you're using a mobile device. Let's just say it's one of the smartphones in the market and it could be a Windows phone, it could be an Android phone, it could be a, an iPhone. And you okay. open up an attachment to an email that contains a customer list, including some very sensitive information. Uh, you save on that attachment once you've opened it and you read it on your device or you close it. And without your knowledge, that, uh, that file has now been backed up to the cloud service that backs up your, your mobile phone. So in the case of Windows Phone, it's SkyDrive. In the case of an Android, it's uh, Google Drive. In the case of the iPhone, it's iCloud. You have now inadvertently taken very sensitive corporate information, and it's now available in your private personal cloud mm. store, and the organization has essentially lost control of it. And today, with current breach notification regulations, there is actually a case to argue that uh, in those situations, the organization should do um, a breach disclosure uh, under the various state laws that exist today in the United States and the various national laws in other countries overseas. So yes, there is definitely a privacy concern there. Going beyond that, where we see mobile devices becoming ever more powerful and, in, and including and adapting into them sensors, such as location sensors, such as environmental sensors, such as Bluetooth and RFID technology, that information may be unwittingly collected by your device and consumed by an application and then stored in the cloud, so your personal privacy is being threatened. And those are just two examples out of many others I could give about privacy and mobile devices coming into conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. No, I think that was a great example, especially about the number of sensors. I mean, I think those are the things that scare me the most because they're things that I don't, you know, I, I have a sensor on me right now. I wear a Fitbit, uh, you know, wherever I go, and there's a certain amount of convenience that I put into that, but at the same time, I really don't know what it's doing with the location information that it may or may not be collecting. You know, so it's the things that I don't think about that I just have with me at all the time. I see those as a bigger danger than things like the email where at least I'm making a conscious choice to download something, uh, you know, to my mobile device and at least I'm control of the process at that point. But I guess when you look into the future, I mean, you know, if I was going to hazard a guess, I would say that, you know, we're going to see more and more wearable electronics and more mobile devices that we're not even thinking about all the time. Are you, you know, afraid for the future? Do you think this is getting out of control and it's only going to get worse? Or is there anything that makes you more optimistic about, you know, privacy kind of coming back under control of the person? 
Yeah, th again, I think th that's a difficult question to answer. And I think I'd have to start by giving my view of what's going to happen in the next 5, 10, and 20 years uh, just Perfect. to put my answer into context. I mm -hmm. think for the next five years, you're definitely going to see your phone continue to be a hub of sorts on your body or around your body. So things like your Fitbits, your uh, Nike Fuel Bands, your Google Glass, whatever else you've got, mm -hmm. it's going to communicate with your mobile device. And your mobile device is going to be the gateway to the cloud. And you're going to have a personal area network around you of devices that communicate with your phone or your tablet. I think that's probably going to continue for the next five years. What you have to be aware of, is though, is that over the next five years, these devices are going to become ever more powerful with more storage options, more processing options. And as a consequence, a lot more of the, uh, the data crunching required in big data scenarios can actually never happen at the mobile endpoint or on the device itself. Mm -hmm. And then the distilled information will then be uploaded into a cloud service where it is then co-located with other information, either your information or other people's information, and then that is then brought together and analyzed and crunched to derive ever more useful information. The question is at what point does the consumer have control over the collection and the analyzing of the information either on the local device or in the cloud? and how can they specify it's used. One thing that I don't think individuals truly understand is the business model that comes with free applications. Because remember from high school economy or economics, nothing is free. And mm -hmm. we use these free tools that we get. And in return, we have to sacrifice a little bit of our privacy. Why? because these companies that provide these free tools live off ad-generated revenue. I believe it was uh, the Wall Street Journal yesterday, it may be in the New York Times, uh, said that Facebook is not a social networking company, it is an advertising company. We mm -hmm. use Facebook to contact our friends, to share information, and to get an understanding of what's happening in our social circle around us. The reality is you are not Facebook's customer. Facebook's customer are the advertisers, and Facebook has built a very good advertising engine that delivers adverts to you based on your, your profile, your friends, where you are, what you do. Now, I'm not picking on Facebook. They're just a very good example of what I'm saying here, that when we download these applications through devices that offer to monitor our health for us or to provide suggestions how to live a healthier lifestyle or tell us about special offers, about, hey, this restaurant is offering a free wings with uh, your main course, that kind of deal that we increasingly see popping up on our phones. It's using information that we voluntarily give to the service either explicitly through creating profiles and selecting preferences, or implicitly by where we are or what we're doing. And consumers need to understand that. They need to understand that they're not getting a free service. They're getting a service, and in return, they have to sacrifice a little bit of their privacy. So it really behooves the developers and the industry in general to educate consumers and users about the privacy choices, what they're going to be giving up in return for this service. That's going to require software developers to understand how to build privacy controls into applications. So I may, as an informed consumer, download an application. I know I'm going to have to give up a little bit of my privacy. It might be location information. It might be my lifestyle information. It might be demographic information. It could be all kinds of information. I have to say, well, I'm willing to share this, and I'll get that in return, but I'm not willing to share this other piece of information, so that means I'm not going to receive these offers or these benefits of, of this application. And developers are going to have to understand how to build that kind of privacy choice based on um, notice choice and consent, which are the principles of privacy, into applications which are on our devices. You can't just simply build an application that invades people's privacy because, in quotes, it's free. You have to make the notice available to them, allow them to make a choice, and make informed consent. Mm -hmm. Great. You, you actually got a couple steps ahead of me because one of the things I really wanted to focus on was what, what is it that developers should be doing different? You know, what is it that we need to train developers to do to make better apps? So I think one of the things that you just mentioned is being able to give people a much more, can I say, a fine-grained choice about which types of information they're willing to share when they put these apps on? I think that is essentially correct, yes. But it can't just be a set of toggle switches. People have to understand what they're giving up and what they're getting in return uh, as a consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really the value. Now, I'm not saying developers should be making these privacy decisions. The developers need to enable the privacy trade-offs in the application. 
but an analyst or a privacy expert somewhere is going to have to craft the, the notice choice and consent uh, that comes around the application so that the developer can understand that and programmatically build it into that app. So I wonder, are you aware of any work where anyone's looking at how to do this? I mean, there's a lot of work into human-computer interaction, of course, but is there anything looking specifically at how do I have this dialogue with the users so that they understand, you know, all the different types of privacy or the different types of information they might be giving away? Because at the, the other end of the spectrum, I could say, okay, great, you know, if developers are going to make these choices a little bit more visible for users, but now every time I have to put in an app, I have a lot of detailed questions I have to go through. Uh, suddenly, I'm seeing the user overwhelmed with choices as opposed to having a pause and I'm not sure that either end of the spectrum is so good. So the simple answer is yes. There are groups definitely looking at this and promoting the right position. Uh, there's an industry nonprofit that the Cloud Security Alliance works very heavily with called the International Association of Privacy Professionals, or the IAPP. And you go to their website, which is www.privacyassociation.org, and uh, they provide a wealth of resources to their members, both corporate and individual members, that uh, raise awareness of privacy and help you build privacy programs in your organization. And if you're a developer, they've got a certification built around that, which helps educate developers and the IT folks about some of the issues which come into play when handling user information. And they've got a number of other certifications. And so that's one set of resources. But companies mm -hmm that might surprise you. Companies such as Microsoft have actually spent a lot of time looking at this as well. Given that Microsoft actually offer mobile devices and Microsoft has in the past been accused of, of privacy violations, they've actually taken privacy to heart. And uh, I remember they used to have a, a document called, I think it's the Microsoft Privacy Standards for Development. Well, Microsoft is better known for its secure development life cycle, which is uh, how Microsoft now writes software to ensure that it meets the trustworthy computing principles, which mm -hmm. were established in a memo uh, over 10 years ago now. Well, they actually took the, their separate privacy development guidelines, which were freely available from their website. You could download them and have a look at them. They baked that into SDL, which Microsoft still uses today. And SDL is freely available. You can go to the Microsoft website. It's www.microsoft.com slash. SDL, and you can download all the resources, and it shows how Microsoft has built privacy into software development at each key point. Now, that doesn't really help organizations consider the privacy trade-offs in the first place. It's just a series of development guidelines and other things that they, they should be considering when building software. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need, potentially, to build a team of privacy experts that are looking at what your business goals are what is required in order to achieve those business goals in terms of the person identifiable information from your consumer, from your mm -hmm. device or your application user, and then build a series of controls around how that information is collected and disseminated and used within your organization and with your partner organizations, and then how you communicate that to the consumer and then allow them, that's through the notice piece, and then allow them to make their choice and provide informed consent which is truly necessary at a minimum to provide privacy. Mm -hmm. So what kind of a skill set does one of these privacy engineers, for lack of a better word? I understand that what we're dealing with is something at the intersection of business because what the trade-offs that I'm going to build into my app are things that I need to have a viable business build on top of. And I also need to know what's technically feasible. So I could imagine it's someone with more of a software development skill set. So do we see someone who needs both of those backgrounds in order to make these trade-offs, these decisions in the right place for an organization? It's not a single person. It is at least a team of a minimum two people. This is because privacy in the United States and other countries is a very uh, troubling growth area. And by troubling, I mean legislators and regulators are looking at privacy and, and consumer privacy in particular. And they are uh, always coming up with new laws. In the U.S., we have a very sectoral approach to privacy. Uh, in Europe and other parts of the world, it's more um, uh, legal-based universal privacy rules. For example, in the U.S., there's no fundamental right to privacy in general, at least with the exception of the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits what the U.S. government can do. But for corporations who are seeking to use your information, it's more about consent, you voluntarily giving your information to that corporation. And then in many cases, there are not being many controls on what that corporation can do. There's certain privacy legislation around 
around credit reporting and how you use credit histories. There's privacy legislation around videotape rentals, for goodness sake, uh, <laughs> because uh, there was a, a problem with video stores using rental information and selling that information. And Congress at the time decided that we had to have privacy over our, our videotape rental records. Not truly clear if that translates to DVDs or online downloads mm. or the red boxes of the world. So sometimes legislation doesn't play catch up. And so you need someone that has a legal background with a question to understand what the, the legislation or your sectoral obligations are. Mm -hmm. On the technology side, you need someone who definitely understands what can be done with technology and is, is able to be an evangelist for privacy through the use of technology. Many organizations look at privacy as a process or a promise or a series of procedures. They don't look at how technology can enhance privacy. The truth is technology can both destroy and enhance privacy. And so that's why you need a technology evangelist, someone who understands technology, how it works, how it can work, and how we can actually implement those privacy protections. Mm -hmm. Good. So I, I have this feeling that we might have just scared a lot of people with all the expertise that is pulled in to make these decisions. Is there any kind of a principle of just do no harm? I mean, is that a good place to start? Or how would you, you know, if someone's a developer at a small company kind of wrestling with some of these questions, how would you tell them to get started? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I mean, the, the problem is that companies are generally in, in the business of making money. And uh, in the <laughs> In order to make money these days, at least for the current business models that many organizations employ, it's ad-generated revenue. And in order to be able to serve targeted advertising, which maximizes the number of times people will click on that advert because it's the right advert for them at that point in time or the right mm -hmm. offer, you need to know more about them. And in order to do that, you need to collect personal information, personal identifiable information, such as socioeconomic status, location information generally, also preferences, likes, dislikes, and that kind of stuff. And so small companies are always going to struggle with this. The people who can really make a difference aren't the small companies because they're always going to want to get out the gate and, uh, and provide a, an app uh, for free uh, and hopefully direct advertising through it or something else or sell information or make money. But the people who really can make an impact are the medium and larger organizations, the ones that are now become a bit more stable and sensible and are perhaps looking at other revenue opportunities. Perhaps they are now able to offer paid-for applications rather than free applications which don't rely on ad-generated revenue. In fact, you actually see this at some of the large email providers, Microsoft like Google does the same, you can actually buy from them them the ability not to be served adverts. So you can mm -hmm. go to your online email and not have adverts because Microsoft or Google will take a small subscription from you instead, and that way you don't get adverts. And, and that's another trade-off. Uh, do you now want to start paying for applications? So yes, there's things that developers can do, but also I think consumers need to be more savvy. We need to be able to say to our content providers, our application providers, look, Great application, great idea. I'm never going to use it because you're going to consume this personal information of, and this information about me, and you're going to sell it or use it to direct adverts to me, and you're going to know too much about me than, or far more than I'm comfortable about. How about I pay you a small monthly amount of money? It might be a dollar ninety-nine, and will that uh, meet your needs instead? And of course, once companies see that consumers are willing to pay that amount of money for the professional or pro level of these apps, where they don't have to rely on ad-generated revenue. We might see a shift in the industry and certainly one towards a model that is more privacy aware. Hmm, great. That's a great place to end this up, actually, I mean, in terms of what the users can do. So I think over this conversation, I've heard two different things. One is the one you just mentioned, to have that dialogue with the app manufacturers that says, yeah, I really want the service. I'm willing to pay more if you give me the pro version and you know, not let me have to worry about all this privacy stuff. The other one was just to be a little bit more thoughtful in terms of what you're putting on there and being aware of the potential privacy leaks, I guess, for some of these apps and keeping in mind that there's no free lunch. Anything else that strikes you as good, solid advice for the user side? Well, I think for users, they have to be aware of what they're getting into. It really is caveat emptor, buyer beware. Mm. Uh, yes, you're not paying anything. You're getting it for free, but you're not really getting it for free. And I think until uh, consumers at least understand what they're giving up in return for, in quotes, free apps, there will be a problem. Now, the downside of this is that if consumers don't start making more intelligent decisions for themselves, and if the industry doesn't step up and clearly spell out what it's collecting and how it's collecting it and what it's using it for, you are going to see legislators step in and start passing some laws that as an industry we don't want to see. 
Uh, self-regulation is always better than legislation, but absent self-regulation, or in this case, education of consumers, and providing consumers that notice choice and consent, you will, I believe, start to see some legislators stepping in and passing some laws in this area. Great. Great. So I, if I could ask one last question, I just as a more personal note, if it's fair to ask, I wonder where you personally kind of come down on the spectrum. I mean, are you not on Facebook? Are you, do you not get into these apps? Are you completely off because you don't find that the trade-off is worth it? Or do, are you someone who sees value in giving away some privacy in a, in a constrained and limited way? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I, one, I don't always answer, but I will. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm not on Facebook. And I do actually pay Microsoft that yearly amount of money so I don't get served adverse. Good. I, I think there's a, a cautionary tale there that the rest of us could really <laughs> could, could take to heart, actually, so I'm glad that you said that. Is there anything else that you feel is an important message to get out that I haven't asked you about today? No, I just think that uh, as an industry, we have to be uh, very cognizant of uh, both the, the power and the benefits that cloud computing and mobile computing can bring to society. There are some wonderful opportunities here to really dramatically improve people's lives, especially around health and welfare, fitness, all that kind of good stuff. But it can also really be a, a bane to the existence of many when we start to invade people's privacy. So there's always going to be trade-offs, and we have to make informed, intelligent trade-offs, both at the developer level and the business level and at the consumer level. And I think everyone has to come together in order to actually have the debate about what is right, what is good, what is bad and wrong and creepy, and then as a society have a consensus. Great. Excellent. Thank you, John. This has been a very thought-provoking conversation, and I think our readers will get a lot out of this. Well, I hope Thanks so, too, and I... And I encourage anyone who's uh, interested in seeing the CSA's viewpoint on this to visit our website, download our mobile guidance. It's tailored more uh, at the organizations that use mobile devices to access the cloud. Uh, but download that, and it's available free of charge for our website. Go to the IEPP, have a look at their website. Check out Microsoft and the other uh, large cloud uh, providers and software developers, too, because they actually have a wealth of resources that they make uh, freely available uh, which are available to you, especially if you're a small company and you're looking to get into software development uh, around mobile computing and you're going to be handling personal identifiable information or personal data, to use the European term. All these large companies have been burned by it in the past, and they tend to make their lessons learned and their business practices freely available uh, as a, a guide to smaller developers and smaller companies, and go check out those resources. So thank you again, John. You're welcome. Thank you. 